Hey, what's up? Hey, Danny. <laughs> In a hotel room there, I see. Yeah, I am uh, I am out of Chicago. I'm OOC. So, uh, ook. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a German word for out of Chicago. Yeah, so sorry. I'm, I'm in Minneapolis right now. So we had to do this uh, Zoom call because I want to talk about the Jerusalem Council some more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like at the the end of the last episode, um, you know, there was there was a lot there. We, we you know we we gave the story, so to speak. But uh, I wonder if maybe some people who listen are thinking, okay, so so what, right? So what what do I take away from this uh, now that I know the information, who was there, what they talked about, what they decided? Um, what's the what's really the impact and the significance, right, of the council? And I don't think we really touched on fully uh, the impact or the import. Um, of the council, even though we said that it it is important for from the Catholic perspective for three major reasons um, in in outcome, but I think there's there's more we can add to that. Yeah, because apart from just like the the, the Catholic points, just for Christianity in general, whether you're Protestant, Orthodox, Catholic, doesn't matter. This this council is it literally changes everything. I mean, it changes all of history. And that's astounding when you think about it, because this is a group of common Jewish men in the first century in the Roman Empire, the glory of the Roman Empire, meeting in an upper room in the corner of Jerusalem, literally like out by like the wall. <laughs> okay, And they're gathering to discuss something that you would think is just like, like, an intra-Jewish debate about, you know, whether or not they should, you know, perform a ritual on certain Gentiles who want to come in. <laughs> on, the, on the face of it, that that would never pass as a significant event. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. on the face of it. As, as they meet secretly or privately in the shadow of this large temple uh, <laughs> that the nation of Israel is going to for their worship um, and their Sanhedrin, their meetings, yeah, this insignificant group of of Jesus followers is kind of meeting and deciding their own fates. Yeah. The meeting of this new Jewish sect in the corner of Jerusalem somewhere. Um, what's really interesting about this is that it, it's really a great commentary on power in general, because if this meeting didn't happen, we would not have Christendom. Christendom would not have happened. You would not have the Byzantine Christian empire. You would have never had the Latin West. You, you wouldn't have in Western Europe. You wouldn't have even had the bulwark of North African Christian. I mean, you wouldn't have had it because the, the decision that they made opened up the floodgates for Gentiles to come and call upon the name of the God of Israel. I mean, it really does. And they do. And, and, and you would have never had the Christianization of the Roman Empire and therefore everything that comes after that. So you literally would not have had Christendom if these if this group of whatever, 60 or 70 Jewish men, like didn't gather in this room one day to hash this out. Yeah. I, um, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's, and I think it's a great point because if, when we when were thinking about two episodes ago, um, you know, the dispute between Peter and Paul, you, you could say that Peter maybe came out of his meetings with Paul earlier in the, in the, in the, um, the forties that Peter's thinking, yes, we're going to go to the circumcised. Yes. We're going to go to the uncircumcised. But he very well could have been thinking, yeah, but separately. <laughs> I to the circumcision, Paul to the uncircumcised, right? Um, and so then you see that that uh, kind of Peter withholding himself from the table, and he, he's thinking in terms of two missions, where Paul is thinking in terms of one mission, circumcised and uncircumcised. Peter, you lead that end, and I'll lead this end kind of thing, and, and we'll meet in the middle if ever we find ourselves at the same synagogue preaching Pre preaching Jesus. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the the big point that, that I would draw out of the council is that the, the council kind of allows the church to really marinate in its quote-unquote Jewishness. It allows the church to soak up everything it can from its Jewish roots before it goes out into the the majority Gentile world. And that, that, that to me is, is very, very important. Um, because of the council decision, Gentile Christianity was not going to grow and evolve apart from the root. And, you know, I'm reminded of, of St. Paul in his letter to the Romans and where he's speaking of Israel 
as the branch, as, as the root, and, and the Gentiles have been grafted onto it, so don't get so arrogant, right? If the council didn't decide that these two groups, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, weren't going to grow together, we're going to have major issues, in my opinion, um, for the church. But the council ensures that they will grow together. And so you get uh, the Gentile Christians sticking to the original kerygma. You get them uh, venerating the Old Testament uh, in, in the Greek, the Septuagint. You, you get them um, practicing the breaking of the bread, the Eucharist. Uh, the synagogue tradition is there and the rule of faith. So all those things are kind of guaranteed to the Gentile church because they're growing still alongside their Jewish Christian uh, forefathers, in a sense. And yeah, yeah, it, it, it allows the apostles to create, in a way, a hermeneutic, a hermeneutic of continuity, to borrow a Pope Benedict phrase, with their Jewish past. Because they know, they've already seen that, like, this is changing very rapidly. We have Gentiles coming in, you know, and, 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 but we have a story here that they need, to, they need to understand in order to be a part of this, right? Because yeah. what is the Messiah to a Gentile? Well, exactly. Well, that, and that's so, and that's so this is, that's that's part of the point is that when you look when you look at Christians who did abandon the roots of the faith, who did abandon their quote unquote Jewishness, I'm t- I'm speaking of Gnostics, right? Gnostic Christianity begins to to yeah. grow up in the late first century and into the second century. These are these are Gentile Christians who took the kind of the the stories about Jesus. Um, the, the the gospel stories about Jesus and took it and over intellectualized the faith. They used this their kind of syncretistic attitude towards religion, taking a little bit from you know the mystery religions of of Persia, taking a little bit from Greek philosophical culture, and completely um, in, over intellectualizing and 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 rationalizing the faith over and against revelation. So now you have this among the Gnostics competing rationalism versus revelation. But what, what the yeah, council... Because, because what ends up happening is you have a denial of history. You have, you have a denial of history. Yeah, if you exactly. deny history, you're denying the sense. You're denying the body. Mm-hmm. You know, because there's no, there's no corporeal story here because you can just divorce the Messiah from the Jewish roots. Yep. And now the Messiah just becomes this sort of ethereal like, and, idea in a way, or this salvation figure that is divorced from any history. Yep. And the, the whole, the whole balance is then thrown off. The whole balance is thrown off and you see that among the Gnostic sects and that's why they become heretics. Um, so, you know, a, a message to modern Catholics is that we, we are very Jewish. We're rooted in our Jewishness. Um, and and you see you see books like that coming out from Dr. Brant Petrie, right? Uh, the Jewishness of Christianity and and rooting the rooting the Eucharist in the Lord's Supper and 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 the Virgin in Old Testament traditions. All those types of things are very important to stress, and it's it's the Jerusalem Council that allows that. Yeah, and this is the way forward for Protestant Catholic dialogue. This is the way forward because and and, and Orthodox too, like Orthodox and Protestant dialogue, Catholic and Protestant dialogue is get to the Jewishness of Christianity, but not not the kind of Jewishness that you hear, you know, some like lower church Protestant sects talk about, where we're really what like we talk about what they're doing is they're invoking a post-Christian rabbinical Jewish tradition and yeah. saying, oh, that's that's what Christianity was like. It was like it was Judaism, you know? It's like, no, no, no. This Judaism, the yeah. first century Judaism, uh, that milieu in which in which Jesus does his ministry. Mm-hmm. That's where we need to go together. Go back to that that rooted history, um, and that's why the Jerusalem Council is a great vehicle for doing that. I feel like I feel like Acts chapter fifteen is a great moment for Protestants and Catholics to come back together and have this dialogue, because all the all the implications of these different positions and these vying positions in the early church um, in this first century are pertinent today. They really are. The more and more you divorce Jesus from the, the story of Israel. The more and more you end up with a Jesus of your own mind, mm-hmm. a God of your own mind. Um, you don't you don't yeah. end up with the, with the Jesus, the, the real Jesus. And you, and then you know you know what the end of that is, right? Depart from me. I never knew you. You know. So yeah. we and, and and then liberal Catholicism is another one of these where it's just like it doesn't matter, right? And the end there's always this suspicion of the Old Testament, the suspicion of the Old Testament God, and you know James Martin is out there like making fun of like the, the Levitical laws and these kinds of things. 
And it's like, that's, that's, you're on the Gnostic road. You're, yep. you're walking down the Gnostic road. Be very careful about absolutely. that. Absolutely. Like, divorce the father from the son. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. So the other thing that, that, that really, really strikes me. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just, I was just agreeing with you. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing is that um, with the apostles, right? Like, who woke up that morning? Like, let's let's go back, right? It's it, it, so it's it's Acts chapter fifteen morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, uh, you know, who woke up that morning thinking that what they were going to do that day was going to set the tone for the rest of human history? I'll tell you who. And the Emperor Claudius, right? <laughs> like, he woke up that morning thinking that the decisions he was going to make that day were going to be, you know, totally significant to the, to the future of human history, right? Yeah. And, and, and if he would have even known that these obscure jews were meeting in a house in jerusalem of, you know deciding whether or not gentiles need to be circumcised he wouldn't even care care much about it <laughs> like, <laughs> freaking cares you know? <laughs> that would be his posture mm -hmm. um but what's really interesting is that if i go today i walk outside today and ask somebody who is emperor claudius 90 percent of people would be like i have i don't know like, yeah. maybe some roman emperor. i don't know yeah. roman emperor or something, random roman right? emperor but if I ask them, who is St. Peter? Yeah. Who is St. Peter? Who's St. Paul? Hey, in fact, I'm in Minneapolis right now. One of the cities, it's a twin city. One, one of the cities here is named St. Paul. <laughs> it's, not, it's not Emperor Claudius. <laughs> so so that, that's very interesting because that's, that's a great commentary on the very, the nature of power and, and, and just how these insignificant moments of human history, seemingly outwardly insignificant moments of human history can actually shape the very future of the world. And what's what's even more astounding is that these apostles, these people gathering this room, somehow they knew that what they were about to decide was the fate of the world. I mean, you read Paul's letters, you read James, right? His letter, you read Peter's letter, you can tell, and, and, and the council itself, you can tell these people understand that like this decision will literally decide the fate yeah. of the world. <laughs> yeah. And it's, yeah, exactly. And it's, and it's not just um, like we, like we mentioned in the, in the, in the video, um, it seemed good to us and the Holy spirit. You know, they, they truly believe that when they gathered, when the apostles gathered, when the when the the early bishops gathered, when the elders gathered, the presbyters were there in council, and they came to a uni unified decision. It was the Holy Spirit's decision, um, together with the church. That that's that's a kind of authority that you can you can rest in, um, and rely on. And so, for for the Catholic, that that should that should um, be encouraging, because that's what we teach. That when our when our bishops come together. Uh, the the successors of the apostles, and they come to a unified decision concerning something. We do believe in these ecumenical councils that the Holy Spirit has spoken, and and that's important for the church's unity. Yeah, for sure. And 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 the thing is, if I'm if I'm having a dialogue, you know, for instance, with like a Protestant about this. And they would say, oh, well, that kind of authority is really just restricted to the apostles. Now, we, we had a previous episode about this one, um, about the idea of the apostolic authority passing on um, to the church. It's like, it doesn't make sense that only one time when an issue thirty comes up years. that Jesus gave no direct <laughs> word, yeah, that, 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 that Jesus gave no direct word on, and that the scriptures don't speak clearly on, that only that one time the, that the church would have the authority to make some kind of an authoritative decision that the Holy Spirit agrees with, a, a gathering that would be guided by the Holy Spirit, it doesn't make any sense that, that would only, yeah, like you said, that, that would only happen for a period of 30 years, and then for the rest of the church's history, it's all, hey, good luck out there. I mean, yeah. just try to read the Bible as best you can, and, and, and yeah, you'll break into sex, and then Jesus will sort of, he'll kind of sort it all out at the end. You know, it's like, what kind of a covenant is that? And, well, and, know, and, and beyond that... Good. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, getting into the Episcopate, you know, so people, you know, we have to we have to kind of think about, well, once the apostles are, are dead and gone, 
is there then just a, a, a vacuum of the Holy Spirit in the church? Uh, no, somebody, somebody's got to take the place, right? I mean, somebody has to be step in, some body of people has to step in to guide and lead the church. Yeah, and I don't disagree that in some sense, the scriptures, that's why the canon is formed, right? Because you have like Gnostics, you have all these different groups, you know, our, our listeners are going to see as we go through the history, we have all these different groups claiming things. That's why they decide, okay, well, we need to get the canonical writings here, right? To show them that that's yeah. not the case. That's not what the apostles thought, right? So there is a sense where the scriptures do partially fill that void. But then, like I said, you still have the issue where just like the apostles had this open question about the Old Testament, like the Old Testament doesn't speak on this. We in the church have the same issue many times with the New Testament. What, <laughs> what is the teaching here well, like on this you specific issue? You mentioned you mentioned uh, putting together the canon as as a way to defend the church and its authority and its author, uh, teaching authority, uh, but there's there's three things that we will definitely get into and it's it's canon, it's creeds, but it's also succession. Those are the three uh, yeah. bulwarks that protected the church as it moved into the second, third, and fourth centuries. Yeah, so succession and you, see, is very important. you see succession. You see succession right there in Paul's letter in Timothy. He says the gift that I have bestowed upon you through, through the laying on of my hands. Mm -hmm. And that laying on of hands has continued from Paul to Timothy and onward. And, and, and from Peter to this, you know, <laughs> like every single church has these successions that, that look, I am now consecrating you to the apostolate. You are going to serve the function and the ministry of the apostolate to the church, which is a necessary function a necessary function. Otherwise, the church is going to break into factions and nobody knows what's going on. And we, yeah. have, we trust God that he's not going to leave us so that the Holy Spirit will not guide what we're doing here. And the second thing, hang on one second. So, so the second thing is that in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, in our previous episode, we talked about this, like, you know, way back when, when we, we, we mentioned where, when Paul uh, says to get rid of that man, right, who's sleeping with his mother-in-law in 1 Corinthians, He's like, get rid of him, deliver him to Satan, you know, and maybe he'll be saved <laughs> in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Discipline him. Well, what's interesting is this the second, the second letter of Corinthians. They've apparently restored this man. They have restored this man, and they're basically asking Paul if that was okay. And Paul says, well, did you restore him? Then if, if you did, then I did as well. Mm -hmm. So that right there shows you that the authority of the presbyterate that has received the laying on of hands of these apostles, Paul treats them on the same level yeah. as himself. And you can't have it both ways, like from a Protestant perspective. You can't have it both ways where you say, oh, well, Peter was just a presbyter like everybody else. You know, they always say that, like your fellow presbyter, Peter says in this letter. It's like, okay, you, you can't on the one hand say that all this authority and power is restricting the apostles, right? But on the other hand say, well, yeah, they were just like presbyters like everybody else. <laughs> it's like, well, which is it? <laughs> and one of those things about like the contrast between Paul's communities and, and the James community in Jerusalem and I would say even Antioch, is the very fact that there are no apostles out there where Paul is going to do his ministry. So it was almost like Paul filled that void for them. He yeah. was the, Paul himself was the apostolate out there, <laughs> what we would call the, the ministry of the apostolate. And then he has this, then he has all these presbyters, right? So they're looking to Paul, like, Paul, what should we do? <laughs> you know, what's the decision? And then yeah. Paul would give the decision and the president, you know, implement it. And then you have like all the deacons. Well, when Paul's gone, now what? That's where you start to see immediately. I mean, it is immediately. You start to see. Well, that starts coming up, right? You start to see. Like, then you have Ignatius of Antioch. Then you have Polycarp of Smyrna. You have, then all of a sudden you start to see these men come to the fore where you have a proto-presbyter who is filling the vacuum of the apostolate. And it's not a vacuum that, that, that wasn't meant to be filled. That's what I was saying. It was God's will. That, that the proto-presbyters who are stepping forward were the companions of the apostles would fill that void, and they would train others. And, and again, it just right yeah, down that's, the line. And in, that's, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a seamless pattern of succession. Yeah, and that's a Catholic thing. We're, we're confident in the church's development. So when we see a development happening that becomes universal, right. we as Catholics are confident in that because we believe that the Holy Spirit is behind it, uh, just like the Holy Spirit was behind the Jerusalem Council. Because, because we, we consecrate history. We consecrate history. We know that history is complicated. We know that things develop. We know that God loves process. Yeah. That's the great thing about the Catholic way. It's the great thing about the lowercase c Catholic way. 
God saves people even through process. God saved the people of Israel through process. He starts with a little tribe, you know, Abraham wandering around in the desert. And by the end of it, you've got the kingdom of Israel. That's a, that was a process. God loves that. He loves to watch unfold. Look at creation. How long creation has been unfolding in its fruitfulness. And we keep seeing more and more wondrous things that are happening, you know, century over century. Well, it's the same thing here. We, we shouldn't expect anything different when God establishes the church. We should see something that's very primitive in the beginning, kind of convoluted, but then it starts to take structure and form and it, and it becomes beautiful and it starts to grow and, and organize and go out into all the nations and set the world on fire with the gospel. Like that's what we would expect. That's the kind of God we worship. Yeah, no, well put. So, you know, when people say Jerusalem Council, so what? Hopefully we've kind of given given some context and answer to that that important important question, right? Yeah, definitely.